Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Pointy Not Sharp. Today, we're taking a look at the bayonets of the Gallipoli campaign. Now, the Gallipoli campaign essentially started on the 25th of April, 1915, and uh, every year that is commemorated in um, Australia, New Zealand, Turkey, Gallipoli itself, uh, probably France and Britain as well, to a degree. Uh, and with the 25th of April just around the corner, I thought it'd be a good time to discuss these bayonets. Now, I'll briefly describe what the Gallipoli campaign was. Uh, it's um, a very, very large topic. There's a lot of reading that goes into it, so I'll just summarise it for you. Essentially, the Entente Powers, or the Allies, uh, consisting of uh, the British, the French, and the Russians, and all the sort of subsidiary countries under them, like Australia and New Zealand underneath Britain, uh, and a couple of other countries underneath France, they were attempting to uh, control the Ottoman Strait. And um, there were three reasons for this, really. First, they wanted to be able to get close to Constantinople so they could bombard it uh, with uh, naval power. And um, by doing this, they wanted to uh, cut off the Asian side of the Ottoman Empire, really restricting what the Ottomans can bring to the table uh, throughout the war and um, almost decapitating the Ottoman Empire, essentially um, administering a decisive blow that would knock them out of the wall. And finally, they were looking at uh, opening supply routes with Russia through the Black Sea and uh, maintaining security of the uh, Suez Canal. So there was a fairly big advantage to, uh, maintain, to capturing Gallipoli and the, uh, the Ottoman Strait. Now, in February of 1915, the Allied fleet uh, tried to uh, force their way through, but they were repelled, they failed. So in April, amphibious landings were made uh, at the beaches of Gallipoli. Uh, being Australian, and well, actually, I'm a Kiwi myself living in Australia, um, we formed the Anzacs, Australia New Zealand Army Corps. And um, we were essentially assigned to uh, Anzac Cove, which is uh, something that's drilled into the consciousness of uh, both of our countries. So on the 25th of April, um, huge numbers of um, Anzac soldiers, British, French, um, stormed the beaches and they met very little resistance on the first day. However, they didn't really push their advantage and very soon the whole campaign just descended into some of the worst trench warfare of the entire war, at least from the perspective of the Anzac soldiers. The fighting continued on for about one year and um, eventually the Entente powers or the Allies staged a retreat using a fair bit of deception to get their forces away without being uh, annihilated on the beaches boarding boats and uh, they were pretty successful. They, they got away without taking too many losses at all. Uh, it was an overwhelming victory for the Turks. That said, once um, all was said and done, both sides had lost 57,000 soldiers. The British lost uh, 31,000, the French 9,000. Australia lost 7.5 and, and New Zealand lost 3.5. Those numbers don't sound too high, but Australia and New Zealand, particularly New Zealand, are tiny, tiny countries and very, very new countries. And uh, those were absolutely devastating. Uh, that was felt for generations. The Ottomans also lost uh, 57,000 soldiers as well. So it's a horrible, very bloody campaign. Now, that aside, we'll um, take a look at the actual bayonets and the equipment used by either side. You might notice I've got my little trench, trench whistle here. Uh, that's actually 1917 dated, so that's after um, Gallipoli. Uh, this one was actually recovered from the battlefields of Hamel, so that's very cool. That's another very uniquely Australian um, part of the war. Anyway, I'll move this one out of the way, and we'll start with the British forces. So, the British at the time were using the short magazine Lee Enfield. And with the short magazine Lee Enfield, they were using the Patton 1907 bayonet. Yeah, I'm sure you've seen these before. I've done quite a few videos on them. I'm quite fond of them myself. The two I have here, we have one Australian and one New Zealand. Um, I don't have a British one on me at the moment. I just swapped my British one for a New Zealand one. I'm very happy to do so because they are extremely hard to get. Now, as you can see, we have a very, very long one-sided blade. 
short magazine Lee Enfield was a shorter rifle and they compensated for this by having a very long bayonet. Which is actually styled after the uh, the Japanese Type 30 bayonet if you've seen those. So pretty much all the British forces were using these, the British themselves, the Australians and the Kiwis, New Zealanders. Uh, this one here, actually I'll get it on camera if I can. There you go, you can make out all the Australian markings. So we have, focus please, or I might put a photo up. We've got a military district number, the fourth military district that um, represents a state within Australia that this was issued to. We have a serial number and then we have our Lithgow stars for inspection marks. And on the reverse we have uh, Lithgow being the factory is manufactured, data manufacturer, I think this one's in 1918. And yeah, like a Lith Lithgow crest at the top. So these are very, very cool, very collectible. Um, and they come from all different countries. This New Zealand one is just made in England, in the UK. So we have all of our English manufacture marks and bits and pieces. I've done some great videos on those, check them out. What makes this New Zealand though, focus please, is our big NZ stamp on the pommel. I hunted for one of these for a very, very long time. Uh, being a Kiwi, I was desperate to get something from my home country. Um, they don't pop up very often. When they do, you have to jump on them because they disappear quite quick. Now, moving on. Next, I will cover the French forces. So, the French were primarily using the Labelle rifle with their infantry, and uh, the Bertier, I believe, was in more of a... Uh, rearish kind of role. I could be wrong though. Please correct me if I am. And a uh, combination of these two bayonets were used. Now, both rifles had a whole bunch of different variations. There were long labels, short labels, and there were about 10 different Bertiers. Um, by the end of the war, there was God knows how many. Um, generally, the Bertier bayonet was used on the original 1892s. The ones that were manufactured during World War II, I believe, took the label bayonet. But taking a look at these, if you've seen my video on the Labelle bayonet, it is one of my favourites. It is about the longest bayonet I've come across. Cruciform blade. And this was named Rosalie after the um, after a song. So France at the time had a lot of really effective uh, war propaganda. It was very romantic as well. And uh, the bayonet itself was uh, very, very prominent in their war propaganda, so much so there's even songs about it. And uh, yeah, nicknamed Rosalie, beautiful bayonet. And as I said, they're also using the Bertier bayonet on their uh, earlier Bertier rifles. This was interesting because it was essentially a, a knife or sword or sabre bayonet. I think they call it a sabre bayonet. And um, France hadn't used a sabre bayonet for quite a while. Prior to this, they were using the Labelle, and before the Labelle, they were using the Model 1874 Epe Bayonet, which was uh, a triform. I wouldn't really call that a sword bayonet either, even though it's kind of kind of is, I guess. And then you go back to 1866, the, the Chasse Poe, that's really the last time they were using sword bayonets. This one's quite interesting, because um, it actually has a fuller running up the spine. I don't know what the purpose of that is, but they're there, and they're quite cool. Um, and there's a whole bunch of different types of these. Watch my video on the subject. I like them quite a lot. I actually only just received the frogs for these two half an hour ago. Uh, the frogs are incredibly difficult to source here in Australia. When you do see them, they sell for stupid money. So I managed to get these for a, a fair price overseas. Now, finally, turkey. So the Turks, again, were using absolutely giant bayonets. This one is a model of 1890. Now they had a bunch of different rifles, but generally only three bayonets. They had the model of 1887, which fit the model of 1887 rifle. Now that was a black powder tube fed rifle, and um, it wasn't as competitive as smokeless powder and uh, you know, rifles using traditional um, Mauser style actions with a, a clip fed magazine. So they replaced them pretty quick. They weren't terribly happy with them. And the model 1887 is identical. Oh no, that's not good. 
that's really sad. That's the first time that's come off. Um, these are very, very expensive and very nice bayonets, and it's a shame to see them deteriorate. I'll have to uh, find a new staple for it. Appears the rear staple's missing too. I'd never noticed that before. Anyway, this is a model of um, 1890. Now, the model of 1887 is virtually identical. The only difference is the muzzle ring sits much lower, almost flush with the top of the blade. Uh, when they replaced the model of 1887, they got the 1890, which is what we have here. Again, watch my video on this bayonet. Um, they're very, very interesting. They're manufactured in Germany, but the markings on them are just phenomenal. So they're made in Zollingen, which is like um, a powerhouse for fine weaponry uh, going back to the 1400s. And uh, our manufacturer mark is actually down here in Ottoman Turk, and the date of manufacture below it, also in Ottoman Turk, in the Rumi calendar. I can't remember exactly what it is, but I think it's like 1300 and something or something like that. Uh, then you um, add, I can't remember the exact number, like 584 or something like that, and that will give you a translation to the Gregorian calendar and you can figure out when they were manufactured. So they're really interesting. Uh, a couple other interesting things about these I really, really like. All of the proof and inspection marks are religious iconography. We have the crescent moon, we have the seal of Solomon, just things like that. Uh, Turkey at the time, or the Ottoman Empire, was a very uh, superstitious country, and it was very common to carry symbols of uh, luck or talismans. So it only made sense that when they had to put uh, proof and inspection marks onto weaponry, why not make them talismans of good luck? So I think that's just really, really cool. Not to mention the really big ball for now, it just looks very Ottoman. I love that. And we also have, I forget the name of it, it's been a year, maybe a year and a half since I did the video on this one. But we have the seal of the Solomon, the seal of the, uh, the Sultan, sorry, uh, down here. I forget what that's called, maybe the Tugger, I, I can't remember. Um, and yeah, that's about this one. So, as I said, the 87 and the 90 are both about the same. Then um, they introduced the model 1903, which is essentially a Zeitengewehr 98 uh, with this style of handle and crossguard and hook quillen. I don't have one of those. I've been chasing one for over a year and I still haven't even seen one go for sale. I might end up just getting like a, a shortened converted one into a model 1935. Uh, and just do a video on that because the originals, they don't pop up terribly often. This one here was actually captured at Gallipoli by a British soldier, I believe. It was a battlefield bring back. Uh, it was documented, the uh, details of the soldier along with his medals were passed down in the family and it was only recently it was moved into the, um, the, the collector's market and a good friend of mine picked it up. Uh, they certainly made him pay for it, but um, it's a nice, beautiful piece of history. Uh, very elegant weapons. And uh, taking a look at the scabbards, it's quite difficult to find them still with the scabbards. They have this uh, nice locket at the top, which is unique from any other country, really. Just very stylized, and then, again, the shape down the bottom. The leather, unfortunately, is deteriorating. And as you saw before... I pulled the locket off and I'm very angry with myself for that. I should have known better and clasped it by the locket when I removed it. Um, I guess I'll have to find, yeah, some kind of uh, period correct staple to staple the leather back in so this doesn't happen again and make sure I treat the leather and touch it as little as possible. I should probably not be touching it now. Anyway, guys, those are the bayonets of the Gallipoli campaign. Now, as I said, every year we commemorate Anzac Day here in Australia, in New Zealand, in Gallipoli, and again, probably around the world. Uh, I will be attending a dawn service on Tuesday morning, on the morning of the 25th of April. And um, generally, Anzac Day is more important in Australia than Remembrance Day. Um, Gallipoli forged Australia, essentially. We were a, a brand new country and um, we'd only been a country for 14, 15 years at the time. And then this huge traumatic event that touched everyone 
happened and um it's just been seared in our collective consciousness ever since it's a very uh very big part of our our country and our heritage i guess and it's um yeah something that we commemorate every year anyway guys uh, sorry if that's a bit of a downer on the end there but um thanks for watching and uh lest we forget